heal. We also know the stereotype that women were there to be born and go eat. Uh, like we were a lot in um, in Hanyu, who is a harsh mistress, who's supposed to be a totally brilliant revolutionary, top, brilliant, empowering, really brainy. Her function in the story is either to say stupid things so that the old male character can say, why are you really stupid? Let me tell you the way things are and explain things for four pages. Or to kiss the hero. When things are going well, she goes, oh, and eat, and they comfort her. And when things are going well, she goes, wee, and kisses everybody, including the computer terminal, which is male. <laughs> uh, and we all know the stereotype of the blonde in the brass brazier with the bam being rescued by the blonde clean cut, sort of jack booted Nancy type hero. <laughs> all right, that's the past. And whether or not that was the truth, and it wasn't, because there were women writers writing in the quote unquote golden age, we just don't hear too much about them. Um, Virginia Kidd, for example, the, um, the science fiction agent, has told me that as far as she can tell, the percentage of women writing science fiction has not changed in the 30 or more years she's been working in the field. But all of a sudden, women are more visible. Um, if you ask somebody to name, you know, name three dozen women science fiction writers, good ones, I think you could do it now. Women are still underrepresented. I mean, we're 52% of the population, but we're about 10% of the, of the names of the byline. But we're getting there. Also, in the nine or 10 years I've been in fandom, uh, women have gone from being you know, two in the audience, token men, to being uh, a good maybe 40% of the fan population. So things have changed, things have shifted. And this is what the panel is going to talk about. Um, what changes have there been and what changes do these women who are all writing now, who are all influencing the field, Amanda as a fan and the other women up here as writers, what do they think they're doing? Um, what changes do they do they want in the field? What changes are they going to make? Now, I'd like each of the people on the panel to talk for a little about what she's doing, and then we're going to have a discussion format, and then we'll break for questions. Okay, uh, Kate first, I think, please. participating in creating a network of women readers, writers, booksellers, critics, um, you name it, just about. People who are talking to each other, working together, um, helping each other out, putting each other into contact with other people. Let me give you just a quick rundown of kind of what happened, because I did not set out to do this. I was just there at the right moment, and somehow I already got involved in it. Um, I published a book in 74, that's uh, Walking Into the World, my first book. And 
one of the first things that happened was <laughs> the summer before in 73, I went to a local convention in Albuquerque where I'm living. And it was almost all men, and it was kind of scary. And I sort of backed off and said, well, I'll sit in the corner and write my little books. What am I going to be doing with these people? Because I don't feel that I have too much in common, and they're all sort of male, and you don't see that too much in common with me either, uh, for other reasons as well. But then, things started to happen, such as, um, the first review I ever saw of Wild was in a magazine called Publishers Weekly, which some of you may know of. It's um, a professional magazine for, I guess, booksellers, mostly because it's sold ads and books for bookstores. And a reviewer for PW, by the name of Alice K. Turner, gave me a lovely review. And it was forwarded to me by my editor. And Alice and I began to correspond. And the next thing you know, Alice said, well, I've been corresponding with Joanna Ross about your book because it came up in some context for it. So she put me in touch with Joanna. And the next thing that happened was Joanna and I were making a list of books by women, science fiction books by women, the um, shape of which has changed over a period of two or three years. It started with just science fiction books with women's names on them. And then it began to be science fiction books with women's name on, names on them that were about women, at least partly, and that women who were reasonably conscious of being women might enjoy reading. And that, that list is now, I guess, maybe 20, 22, 24 titles on this. By no means complete, we usually have one title for all of them, I guess, it's not true. And um, so we started, we started putting them together and consulting with each other. And by the time I got my hands on something called the New Women's Survival Handbook, Are folks here familiar with that, it's a big red cover, newsprint format, general catalog of services and items of interest to women. I had this list to see. So I said to myself, oh, look here on page X, there's a list of women's bookstores. Well, that sounds pretty good. So I sent out letters to those women's bookstores with a copy of my book and a copy of the list. And I said, hey guys, I don't know if they got I don't know. <laughs> I did that one of my classes, and the women told me to stop it. I was very clear. Please tell me to stop it. Um, maybe you don't know that we exist, but we do, and there are quite a few of us. And if you don't like my book, try some others, because there are several to take a look at. Well, I got such really encouraging and pleasant and friendly responses from some of those stores that I then sat down with all the phone books in the university of all the big cities I could find and tried to find women's bookstores. Well, I couldn't find too many. So I found women's centers who said, wrote to them and posted a postcard. And said, if there's a women's bookstore in your area, let me know. I got back again, something like, 50% response on the questionnaire, I think that's pretty good. As these things go. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. An excellent response. Um, even from people who said, we don't have one, but you know, what are you doing? <laughs> or, uh, we don't have one now, but we're going to have one. We're working on one. Uh, we hope to have it next year. So then I wrote all those books to the usual school. And around that time, um, I started being aware of the feminist press. So I sent out the same book and the same list to them. And I said, I hope somebody there is reviewing these things, because here we are. And we do like to get in touch with your readers and can you give us a hand. Again, reasonable response, not as much as from bookstores. Press people don't seem to be as uh, they don't have as much time. But most of them were very nice. Well, the next thing that happened was Vonda McIntyre got in touch with me and said, Hey, we're having a conference to know. Uh, what's the name of that place in Oregon? Not Portland, a little place. Eugene? <laughs> Corvallis, thank you. Corvallis. Corvallis. <laughs> in Corvallis, Oregon. It was supposed to be, it was built for purposes of being financed, I think, and allowed by the University College. It was built as um, a uh, education, yes, not sex education, but future. And it turned out to be a sort of a Conference within a conference, and inside it was a secret women's science fiction conference going on. <laughs> inside it was up in the ring. We'd all get together and talk together. And there I met Joanna the first time and Ursula Lynn and some other folks. And it was really very nice and made me feel as if I belonged to a community that wasn't just me doing one to one things with these bookstores and, and papers and so on. And that was great. You know, that really made me feel good. Um, and it resulted in other things. Like then, Joanna came along and said, Hey, we're doing this symposium. Um, uh, 
of the capture rules and the topology. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, bibliographical information. Kitchen three four published by Jeff Smith in Baltimore, Maryland. I think I have the address someplace. Is uh, a symposium on women in science fiction, including um, responses from Kate and from Susie, and it's going to be published by Mirage Press as a book. Watch for it. You keep hearing it's going to be published by Mirage Press. I'm waiting. But that was great because that was exchanging information and mostly views and opinions and. Um, general kinds of ideas with a lot of other people who were concerned. There were something like 12 of us, I guess, and some I had met and some I hadn't had any contact with. So there was that going on. And at the same time, uh, I could go on. There are things like this happening all the time. Let me stop at this point. But the point is that there is this network forming. For instance, when I went to Corvallis, I had a bookstore visit. I had contacted the, the book and tea shop in Corvallis. And they knew me, and I could walk in and say, hi, what's happening? And it was a very pleasant feeling to have friends there that I could go and talk to. So, aside from writing books, which I hope to continue, I'm also, I hope, doing something to help build up this network so that we know who we are, each of us, and what each of us can do for the others, and where to go for help when we need it, because you can need it sometimes. And who to invite in to something that looks like this would be really good, and someone might be interested. And that's terrific, and I love it. Thanks, Susie. The question of, of creating an audience for perhaps the experimental work that women are doing is, is obviously an important one, uh, particularly when we keep hearing horror stories of publishers refusing to publish uh, books because, quote unquote, women writers don't sell unless they're Ursula Le Guin, close quotes. Um, and obviously, this is part of what Amanda. Uh, Amanda Vancouver is doing with her fancy, The Witch and the Communion. Um, Amanda, would you like to tell us about it, please? Hello, there we are. Uh, like a lot of fans, first time I saw fans, and I said, you'll never get me published in one of those things. And about two years later, I was a founding member of the Hamilton Women's Center. And as a lot of people will know, one of the purposes of women's centers is to make sure that women will not be restricted to typing letters and running off newsletters and so on. And one of the privileges of being the founding member of the Women's Center is getting to type form letters and write <laughs> off newsletters. And at this point, this was my undoing because I found out how to write an email. <laughs> so I went along for a while and I was looking around like a science fiction fan for a long time. And I had noticed something, which was that the women writers were really good. But I never heard how Joanna Russ felt about being the bogey woman of science fiction. I never heard how it was that Bonnie McIntyre suddenly burst full blown upon us. I never heard how Kate Wilhelm had gotten through uh, all her years writing so well and being a woman writer. And all of this was tremendously interesting to me, and nobody was talking about it. So I put an ad in the Discom Progress Report and started up the magazine to uh, see if we could get people uh, talking to each other about women, and very particularly women talking about uh, women, because it's an interesting thing about talking with men, is that you begin to sound like a broken record. And it's, it's a useful function, education, but it doesn't advance things much. So basically what I'm doing is creating a, the ghetto that we've never had. Somewhere where women talk to each other. And this depended on whether women want to talk to each other, and I found that very much so they do. And a lot of the things that I wanted to hear, I now have heard. And a lot of things that I hadn't thought about have started getting talked about. So this is how it got started. The other fascinating thing about what's been happening with me is that it isn't just those of us here who have been uh, tangled up with all the paraphernalia of 
fandom for a long time who are fascinated by our field. There are thousands, millions of feminists in the United States, Canada, Australia, and everywhere else who have suddenly discovered that science fiction is not our larger stuff. They've suddenly discovered that that, that book that sells so well in women's bookstores, The Left Hand of Darkness, is my god, science fiction. So there is a tremendous upsurge of interest in the feminist community in science fiction and fantasy. And uh, one of the rewards of publishing what I have been publishing is finding that I'm bringing together people from both sides to talk to each other. Um, the other thing that I think can be done by this sort of publication, and I hope to some extent I'm doing it, is providing a place for women to get started with things. There are a lot of uh, you may know the difference between an extremist and a moderate is that the extremist believes what the moderate believed, but she believed it earlier. <laughs> and it's very helpful if you're trying to write, if you can write and get some response. But if you are starting off, editors, probably for good reason, are inclined to avoid you because it's unknown, it's not marketable. And similarly, if you're commenting on something that hasn't uh, attracted much attention before, people will say one of two things. They'll say, oh, but this is entertainment. That's too controversial. Or worse yet, that's political. Or else they will say, but, but women are so trivial. I mean, you talk about housework of all things. Uh, writing papers on housework, you better believe it. But, uh, a lot has been learning to become that, and it's starting to become quite respectable. So this is uh, the sort of uh, progression that I am liking very much to see. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, well, Susie and Amanda are bringing new women readers into the field, and also expanding the uh, the parameters of what women writers will write about. Um, Marta is a representative of the new professional writers who are women who are, who are writing. Okay, Marta, what are you writing about? Why, why are you writing science fiction? I like to tell stories. <laughs> I like to tell stories. I like to read stories. I like to write stories that people like to read. I write science fiction specifically because I am a woman. I am concerned with the place of women, with women's capabilities. And it strikes me that science fiction is one of the very few fields left in which I can talk about the world I'd like to see exist. Most feminist literature, most mainstream feminist literature, is concerned with the world we live in right now. And for a lot of feminists, it ain't a very pretty world. I want to talk about after the revolution. I don't want to deal with um, being unable to do X or Y or Z because I happen to uh, have equipment a little different from that carried around by President Ford. <laughs> uh, someone, having read A City in the North, said, uh, gee, you have one truck drivers in there. Oh, yeah, I have one truck drivers in there. for the right trucks. You don't point a finger at it, you don't say, hey, look at this, look at this, this is a broad driving truck, this is incredible. I don't want to have to deal with that. So I write science fiction, I create my future universes in which I can deal with what I think are important questions. The things that entertain me, the things that interest me, the things that I hope entertain and interest you. Uh, the struggle for equality is, if not always entertaining, certainly always interesting. But I don't want to deal with that. I, I want to make my future worlds. And I hope to God that those future worlds are not going to give us the same problems which uh, inequality is giving us right now. Here, here. Uh, thank you, Maria. And that, that leads neatly into something that, that Susie said in the Picture Symposium, to which she referred earlier, that 
She said, I think science fiction is ideally suited to the needs of any group that feels itself to be oppressed. Now, does anybody on the panel want to comment on that? Um, Susan, anybody? We were wondering if um, a fellow named Craig Street was around. He was running a, um, a fan magazine from the point of view and written by American Indians for a while. I think it's gone out of business. Uh, Craig became a professional SF writer and is writing stories from the point of view of the American Indian because women and Indians are both aliens in North American society. My own point of view about that is just that uh, similar to uh, what we just said at the end of the table. And that is that there are only so many times you can read or write um, what is a better than that housewife or whatever. There are plenty of good books like that. And after you've read a couple of them, you get to the point where you read another one you're cut their throats. So they've got to do something different. And I think the thing about science fiction is you can pick up on all the dreams and the ideas of a group that is asking for changes. And they can be good dreams or they can be bad dreams. And you don't have to go through all the stuff about what it's like to pin a diaper on you know, to make your point. You can get right to it and exaggerate things if you like. One of the things I was doing in walk is just that. I just said, well, what would happen if you took sexism right to its extreme? She went all the way to the end with it. Just really stuck with it right to the end. And that's not something I could do about the real world too well without seeming very grotesque. Mind you, it's probably pretty grotesque in walk. But that was part of what I was doing then. And my present book is about what about what if you picked up the idea of, a, of the Asian Amazons. And you really picked it up and made a real story about Amazons. Not phony Amazons, but real Amazons. Uh, what does you like? And I, I didn't have any real good time for that. And that's what I mean by dreams. Uh, the first book was a nightmare. The second book, I think, is much more a dream reading. I really enjoyed it. I hope some of you will like reading it. I'd like to do more things like that. And I think that other groups who feel that they are being denied certain aspects of their own development would find similarly that they could explore those aspects as they don't exist in reality by projecting them into the future or into a parallel universe or running alongside ours or into an imaginary past or whatever you like. But I think it's very healthy to be able to do that instead of sitting around banging your head against the everyday things that are happening to you that remind you of your limitations. There's another aspect uh, of the same thing which shows up very well in Susie's original nightmare, which is that uh, nothing can give you quite as good a view of reality as unreality. One of the shocking things, in shocking in the best sense of making you think about what the end of the world is that this extreme, this nightmare, sometimes doesn't sound that much different from real life. Yeah. A lot of people that said that it kind of shook me up the first time. Somebody said, that's not fiction. And I thought, oh, my shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor kid. <laughs> Where are you coming from? Uh, but it's, it's happened since. In fact, uh, someone was teaching, uh, Mark Kirsty, I think, was teaching a, uh, a class in women's, how did it work? Something like women's ideas for the societies, OK? And she taught that book, and she said, and a lot of people said they thought that was pretty on the mark for what was really their experience, their inward experience, I think is what she needs, <laughs> I hope. Their inward experience of, of what it's like to be conscious of what's happening to you as a woman in the present world, um, even though the physical details are not the same for most people. Please, God. Kate, was this kind of freedom to imagine what brought you to us up? When I, when I started writing, um, I, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, and I didn't know that SF was a man's field. Nobody told me. So I, I, I really didn't know, and I just started writing what I wanted to write, what interested me. And about 10 years later, I realized I had uh, just bubbled my way into a man's field. And people were asking me questions like, what are you doing in this field? What's a nice girl like you doing here? <laughs> and I, of course, I wanted to use my imagination. And I wanted to write about what will happen to him. I think that's what we're all in here for, what if. And that what happened to him is great fun. But after I've been writing a while, and people began uh, reading my stuff more, 
They say, another Kate Wilhelm woman, another Kate Wilhelm man, because so often my women are stronger than my men in my picture. And it wasn't just that I deliberately set out to do that, I was writing the people I had seen around me. And that's me. So it was a shock to people to see strong women in fiction, and especially in science fiction. And what's been happening more recently is that half of my stuff is getting published without the label, science fiction. But if, you know, if one is, the other is. So there's really very little to distinguish what is and what isn't. And I think this is good for me, it's good for my work, and I think it's good for the women writers, and good for the field as a whole. Because a lot of people are beginning to say, well, they're writing real things over there in that crazy area. Maybe we can read it. So I think that's a very good thing to be doing. Uh, Kate and, and the other women on the panel, have any of you had any troubles having your characters accepted by editors uh, or by the science fiction public? And one of the myths uh, that current is that women coming into science fiction are going to be writing a literature of character and sensitivity, while the men write the best and most popular story. Um, you know, is, is this true or is it just a myth? Um, well, talk about character, Kate, please. <laughs> Yeah, I'll start with that because I write very little technological fiction because I'm not interested in it. I don't care about the nuts and bolts. I don't care how that spaceship is put together. You know, if my people are going to get on, I assume that like a streetcar is going to work. But it will not work. <laughs> so already I'm starting, I think, in an, an advanced position from a lot of science fiction writers who want to describe the wheels. So that didn't happen. <laughs> That never was interesting for me. And the trouble I had uh, with selling a story once, I wrote a story about a woman who was about 70 and was still sexually active. And I could not sell that story anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and editor said, oh, this is a nice story, and I would really like to see it in print, but not in my magazine. <laughs> I've recently rewritten that story into a novel, and it will be published by Harper and Grove next year. So, you can do things in novels, you can't do it for you. And I, I found that's true, right down the line. I've always been able to do things in novels that I cannot do in short stories because the editors are so damn conservative and so afraid of offending the parent of a child or a librarian or somebody. So I, I solved my problems by going into novels. Susie, <laughs> Murr? Not really in terms of standpoint. The very first story I ever published, um, which I will not tell any of you the name of it, because it's not being on it. It's a fairly straight action adventure, which is only peripherally science fiction. I got a kick out of driving it. And it has got a very, very strong, very active, very aggressive female protagonist. Uh, I only got one comment about this from a gentleman writer of my friends who said, oh, well, that's, that's not a woman there, that's, uh, that's a man. I mean, you have to change the pronouns around uh, No, that's not really the point. It's, it's a woman. Right? She, she's a tough little bitch, but she's, she's a woman. I mean, I don't know people like that who have a little female. You know, people are better off than you I have never had any problems, except for that silly comment, and that was not community. I've never had any problems with my female character. I've never had any problems selling as a woman. I do not think that in this field I have been discriminated against as a woman, as a writer. Now, I have heard from other women writers that they've had bad experiences or unpleasant experiences. I haven't. I basically have been extraordinarily lucky, but I don't really think so. I think that because this is a literature of extrapolation, it is literature oriented to the future, it's a little bit more open. And we don't all have to write diaries of mad housewives to publish books in this field. Um, let me take the cow by the horns and say that. <laughs> I think the stereotype is true. And I think it's true for a good reason. Um, I think that one of the reasons women are coming into science fiction in some numbers now is that there are entire areas which men have simply ignored. And those areas have to do with those areas have to do with human beings or any other 
and the insights of the feelings of uh, the fallibilities of uh, the sexual drives of these people. And I think that because men have ignored these things, women are moving into the vacuum. Now, whether it's natural in some way, psychological or whatnot, for women to treat these these kinds of, of subjects or not, I can't tell you. I know people know for quite a while. But I think that has been an area that has drawn us. And so it's going to be the area we're going to stay in for a while. I personally am bored silly by technological oriented stories. I'm just not, I don't have, I'm not a handyman much. It doesn't appeal to me very much. Um, and I really like stories of character. And I like stories of sensitivity. And I like stories that are concerned with the relations of people to each other and people, real problems of all kinds. And I don't like stories about nuts, bolts, and wheels, because they seem to be boring. Maybe if I were a little robot child, I would like it, but I'm not. <laughs> um, so it seems to me that the stereotype is true for the moment, and frankly, I'm glad of it. Oh, I don't think it's a stereotype. I think that's simplistic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had men writers and fields searching to these people who have devoted a career to sensitive, stories about characters or problems or problems. <coughs> I do believe it's true to say that science fiction has not been particularly concerned with it. Uh, it's not a black and nothing is ever black and white. But uh, we're going to get into it more. And it does seem to be that the writers are concentrating on this problem. I happen to like not some old science fiction. <laughs> I like people more. <laughs> Maybe maybe after this panel is over, uh, the, the the four the four women up here, or maybe maybe me too, maybe I can come too. We'll all sit down and write a really great sensitive okay. novel about about women and men getting together to build a spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, to to uh, do, do any of you have anything you want to add to that? Um, one little thing. I, I'm one of the people who started out having no problems this way in, in terms of getting a story published. Partly because I don't like short stories, in case just explain how that works. Um, I wrote a novel and I sold it very quickly. Um, however, an interesting thing has happened recently. I'll tell you a little bit about this. I can't tell you much because it isn't settled yet. The second book is a book entirely about the or on the menu, whatever. It has turned out to be, because of the nature of the people in it, a very different sort of book from the first one. It has a different pace, it has somewhat different concerns, and I'm going to get some problems with my original editor with this book. It's interesting to come upon this kind of thing now. I'm just hoping. I'm pretty sure that I can get the book published somewhere on my stage. And then we'll find out by the response of readers who's right about whether it's okay to write the kind of story, the second story. Change the shape of the story? I'm not, I can't tell you that. But it is an interesting kind of development. And I just leave it there for you to look at. I think this happens a lot when people uh, take your first novel and they think, oh, you're a writer in X category. Mm -hmm. Your second novel is in the Y category. And they say, well, you have to follow this up. You can't you can go somewhere else. <laughs> um, th this leads into another topic, which is the, the whole question of women publishing their own work, of setting up feminist presses, assuming that the editors don't accept their work, the editors who control the cover of the book, and then both within the science fiction field and outside the science fiction field are turning to feminist presses, to women's presses. Another development in the science fiction field of late has been the development of the, the anthology devoted entirely to women's work. Um, 
by, by sheer accident, I think, uh, Marta is, is publishing a novella in an anthology of three novellas by women. Um, the others are by Vonda McIntyre and, uh, and John Vinge. And there is, by the way, a very funny story about that, which I will interrupt to tell you. Yeah, please, please this do, Marta. Is, um, you've, you've seen the uh, series that Thomas Nelson puts out, three novellas. They're generally juveniles. Uh, they're generally theme novellas, or at least they used to be. Uh, the editor, Bob Silverberg, was asked to put together a package, and he picked out three writers and sent off little letters and said, please bear in mind that this is aimed at upper-level juveniles, and do not write about things which are repulsive to, to mommies and daddies and librarians and stuff like that. And mostly had it to, right. I think. Well, he got a masturbation story. <laughs> He got a homosexual story, and he got a story in which I believe somebody did it with an iguana. <laughs> uh, uh, being, being a brave and stubborn man, he uh, <laughs> wrote the introductions to these three things, and he sent them off to the publisher. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. There were shrieks of horror from the East Coast. The manuscript came back um, eagle, I think, ICBM. <laughs> and what they said was, oh, listen, why don't you do us a nice story by girls? I mean, you know, just give us a nice, three ladies. I mean, that's really, uh, uh, women's fiction is really hot now, and I think we'd really like some nice stories by some nice ladies. <laughs> Women's fiction is hot, but we'd like stories by ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. So, uh, so he got uh, three nice stories by three nice ladies, and I think it's a very nice anthology. It's, it's <laughs> out recently. It's a book club selection. Uh, but I was very much amused at how Thomas Nelson finally did an anthology consisting of female writers. <laughs> Yeah, by default, as it were. Now, what would have happened if we had all turned in masturbation stories? The anthology is called The Crystal Ship, by the way, and I take it there are no masturbation scenes. Uh, not in mine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the, this is part of a phenomenon. By default, as Marta says, slowly, um, specifically science fiction-oriented to, but towards women or science fiction by women, collections, anthologies of science fiction by women are coming to the fore. Uh, Pamela Sargent has edited two anthologies, Women of Wonder and More Women of Wonder. And Vonda McIntyre and Susan Janice Anderson have edited a collection called Aurora Beyond Equality, containing stories by both male and female writers. Uh, working around the theme of, okay, the revolution has come, sexual equality is the norm. What happens, huh? Write a story. Uh, interestingly enough, all the stories that involved societies that were um, weren't truly really egalitarian were also ecologically stable, mm -hmm. which says something very interesting. Um, okay, the people on the panel, is this necessary? Is this a good thing? Um, please, please comment on the uh, well, what, what Amanda called the building of the ghetto that we've never had and that we need. Mm. Uh, you know, is this the route we have to go? I think probably right now it's a very good thing to be happening because it is getting a lot of attention and direct, the attention is directed at women writers and it's directed at them in a way that's going to make a lot of college classes very aware that there are women writers where they haven't been before. Um, interestingly, one young man that we taught at Clarion, which is a writing course, said that he never had bought a book written by a woman. And if he noticed the title was byline by one, he wouldn't read the story in an anthology. Uh, this changed, of course, after. <laughs> I educated him. But there is that aspect that is, uh, I think, more prevalent than most of us would like it to be. That it is by a woman, it has to be syrupy, and it has to be mushy, and it has to be sentimental, and it has to be a lot of other things. And with these anthologies you're talking about, of course, are not like that. And I think they're a very good thing to have happen right now. I hope it doesn't persist, because I want a wide audience. I don't want just women, I don't want just men, or just teenagers, or just um, Martians, or idiots, or any other <laughs> So I, I like it now, but I hope it doesn't last. I agree that I think this is probably necessary for a while, and I hope it's something we'll outgrow for sure. 
As long as it doesn't turn into a sort of reverse sexism on us. Yeah. I'm going to publish this because it's by a woman. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. um, I personally put women of wonder on my science fiction course, uh, also the left hand of darkness, both because I think they're, they're you know, they're, they're left hand of darkness is pro probably the most brilliant science fiction novel that I could think of teaching. And uh, Women of Wonder contains some very, very good stories, but also to balance things like Pretty Maggie Money Eyes and The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, uh, which are also part of our SF heritage. You know, just, just a little balance there, just a little balance. Okay, I think we've got time for one more maybe round of comments, and then I'd like to throw open the panel to questions. And then, as I say, we're going to break just before 4 o'clock, and anybody who's interested in continuing the discussion and meeting specifically with the people on the panel and meeting specifically with the women writers and fans in the audience and just generally getting some more conversation and interaction, we will move across the hall to the music room uh, and start up again after you've all had time to go get a drink and use the segregated facilities. Um, <laughs> one, one question that I, I'd like to throw out sort of as a last question is, are there any difficulties, privileges, what, whatever, that the women on the panel have found as writers and as SF writers? And I'd like to address this specifically to Kate Wilhelm. Uh, both Kate and Susie are married. Kate is the only one of us here with children, uh, which is, uh, I mean, I, there's, there's the stereotype which says, oh, you want to be a writer, dear? How nice. You can do it at home while the children are asleep. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> you ever looked after a four-year-old? Uh, keeping it out of the typewriter. Um, okay, Kate? Well, this is, of course, a three-hour discussion today. <laughs> you started off. And it is very hard to be a woman writer and have a family. And I don't deny it, it's extremely hard. But it can work. Uh, Carol Lemchville used to sit inside the playpen and type. <laughs> say I admire you tremendously for managing it. Um, I have a much simpler situation, which will, I will outline for you in one second. While I have this microphone and all of you sitting here, uh, I would like to make a plug, and then I'll answer the question. I want to make a plug for a book by a woman named Marge Piercy, P-I-E-R-C-Y. Right. She's a poet and a novelist, and she's written a book called Women on the Edge of Time. Unfortunately, it's been published in hardback and it's expensive. And let me um, plug it because I think she's having some difficulty in moving it because it's expensive and people can't afford it. But really, it's a damn good book and it deserves your attention. I'm sorry? Right. There's a piece of that story in Aurora, but it, the publisher of the hardback is not, I think. And it just came out and it's really, it's good. It's good all kinds of ways. Okay, now I'll answer the question. Um, the question was about managing when you're married. Well, I would advise anybody who's about to do this, 
um, to get themselves a husband who is interested in the work, the way most wives are interested in their husband's work. If, you know, if the husband likes what he does, usually the wife will be interested too. I've been excruciatingly lucky. <laughs> I am not sitting up here and saying, if I could, any of you could, because I've really been very, very lucky. And let me tell you how lucky I've been, because I like to tell them that it's very nice. <laughs> uh, first of all, I didn't marry till late. I was 28 when I married. And late. compared to the people in my college class, it was late. <laughs> and um, I married somebody who was not a writer, primarily, although he does do some writing of his own. I married a lawyer. And the lawyer, oh, the lawyer already had two absolutely superb kids with whom I instantly fell in love. They come and visit, uh, I guess it's a total of about three months a year. They are great. In fact, the title of Walk is connected with one of them, and, and she's very pleased with that. Uh, something that used to get said to her a lot when she was being irritating and, and maddening. Instead of socking her in the head, my husband would say, walk to the end of the room and come back very, very slowly. <laughs> And, uh, to give everybody time to calm down. So I was writing down titles one day, and I wrote down, walked to the end of the, and it came out world, and that was it. It has nothing to do with anything. Anyhow, um, but the interesting thing is this. Um, while Stephen knew I was interested in writing, and before very long, he was reading Walk when it was in manuscript. And I want to tell you, he is an absolutely first-rate, superb editor. He writes, this is not clear. What do you mean? Find a better word in the margins. Also, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I found him absolutely invaluable. Absolutely. And I'm fine. I'm continuing to find him invaluable. <laughs> so for me, it's been... It's just been really, really lucky, and uh, I can't tell you how lucky and how really appreciative I am of my own good luck in this matter. Let me add to that. I think mine is a matter of luck, too, and I think any woman who makes it work out, you just plans to be off of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the world know. You have to work hard, but still, you got to have the lucky base. Don't, don't expect less from a husband than you would from a good roommate. <laughs> Marta? There is one thing, though, uh, brief, brief story. I have a 10-year-old son. And uh, yeah, Kate is absolutely right, and yeah, Susie's absolutely right, and boy, is it a pain in the ass sometimes. But last semester, my son's teacher said to him, do you want to grow up to be a computer programmer like your daddy? And he said, no, I want to be a writer like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Um, I'm asked if I had anything to add. I'm not married, but uh, one thing that uh, I did hear about uh, being married is that, uh, as Susie says, it's the interest. If you, uh, if your husband says, well, you can go off. It's trivial, but uh, you can go off and do it. That's strange if you're living with someone, even a roommate, I think. <laughs> so um, I, it's good that some people are pretty lucky. OK, um, do, do any of the other women on the panel have anything that they would like to add while they have a live mic? OK, um, briefly then, we'll throw the floor open to questions before we adjourn uh, and continue the discussion. In, in less, less segregated surroundings, I think. I dislike rows of chairs in theater style stuff. The, 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 the lights in the aisles are not stars. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, since we don't have floor mics, I guess if you state your question just fairly clearly and yes. Susan, we've been asked to repeat the questions once again. We've been asked to repeat the, the questions. Way. Okay, that's a good idea, yeah. The question is, what about women who write under men's names or initials? Um, we don't got to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I have an interesting story on that point, very brief. Uh, not long after work was accepted, my editor sent me a little note, and it said, 
We really think it would be groovy if you had a pen name. How about Ricky Charnas? Because it's a real gutsy story, see, and it sounds kind of, you know, she didn't say Bush, what are we going to say? You know, <laughs> macho sound of thing. Uh, and I wrote back and I said, well, Charnas is my husband's name and Miss McKee is my father's name and Susie is the name my mother gave me and they're going to swallow it. <laughs> <laughs> to compare reactions to what to the end of the world, um, you know, written from the point of view of a woman or from from a man. You know, I that's some, interesting. I had some interesting responses. I know. Yeah. You know, some stuff um, about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I gather that it was necessary. Um, in, in all of the pulp fields, I mean, Judith Merrill has told me that the only the only stuff she published, I mean, the name Judith Merrill was her science fiction when she wrote sports stories and so on. She she had to go into a variety of, of male names, and and it, this ties back with the old stereotypes of of science fiction being a field of literature meant for fourteen year old boys who liked ham radios, and thank God that isn't true anymore. Yeah, the person in the front row here. Uh, I'm sure I'm the only one here who'd like to know: Is there a list? Is there a register of feminist fancies? So there is only one. Amanda, take it. Is the only one? Uh, it's not the. It's. Uh, it was the only one until recently. Uh, I understand that my sister's fanzine is got enough feminist material that you would pretty well have to call it feminist. And this is. Uh, it's called Orca. And uh, if you want to ask her about it in the. Um, uh, in the talk afterwards, it's uh, available, and there are certainly other fanzines that have feminist material, but not too many of them. But there will be more. Yeah. I've got a question to Mrs. Uh, uh, how, how do you feel about, about using your, your, your Mary name, your husband's name, on, on your work? Does it feel like maybe you might sort of be memorializing someone else's name? doesn't really bother me. Um, Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. The question was, does it bother me to be using my husband's name, right, okay. uh, on my work? It doesn't bother me because I, it feels like my name. I have Susie Mickey Charnas just sounds right to me. Um, I can think of people that it would bother. <laughs> I'm going to myself to that just a moment because I'm using my first husband's name. His name is well known. My name, my maiden name is Meredith which is a very nice name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm stuck with it. I began publishing under Will Hill. I had a little, well, I published several books under Will Hill, and then when the divorce came, I was stuck with it. And I would advise any woman, stick with your maiden name when you start writing. Yeah. Um, by the way, when, when you get married, you do not have to take your husband's name. You are not bound by law to take your husband's name. However, once you have done so, it is very hard to transfer back. Depending on the state that you're in. <laughs> uh, yes, questions. In, in the back, in the green shirt. Interesting. Okay. What? The, the people who do the spoken word records, you may have seen the ads in the program book, yes? Um, for uh, the spoken word records with Harlan Ellison reading, you know, Harlan Ellison reads Harlan and, and like that, have, uh, have decided to test market some spoken word records by women writers, and they've done Joanna Russ and Ursula Le Guin, and they're waiting to see what happens, so kindly stampede that man and place orders. <laughs> Over, over there, yes? I'm wondering if any of you have read Many of the Air, and if you think it's science fiction and if you can give some reactions to it. Have we read uh, Monique Wittings? Uh, Wittings. Uh, Wittings. Uh, Wittings. Uh, La Guerriere. La Guerriere, yeah, which, is an, uh, which is a f translation of a French novel about Amazons and, and reactions. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, panel? I haven't read it. 
I've read it. And uh, I put it on the bookshelf next to a book by William Burroughs called The Wild Boys. They're back to back. They make a really interesting set of wild and crazy fantasies. Um, one entirely, almost entirely about women, and one almost entirely about men. And um, I think it's a, it's a really interesting book, really terrific. I don't like the stuff she's done since, but I really like that one, and I recommend it highly. Somebody else read it? Okay. Uh, I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Yes. Writers on, on, on the, the panel, on the panel, what do you think about the neuter pronoun debate? Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hear you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when Henry Ward said in her diary, we can invent word, the new words, but we can't use them. And I feel in the same line, I can invent a new pronoun, I can use the original neuter pronoun, but it reads so awkwardly. And I like prose that reads well. There's a real line, and I don't know the answer. I wish somebody would find one that I could feel comfortable with. Ditto. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm there. Uh, yeah, okay, Jennifer, and then I think that's it because really there has to be another panel come in here. I'm afraid we started late. So we have to leave this specific room, but we are adjourning across the hall to the music room afterwards. Yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, uh, Jennifer has just pointed out that in Marge Piercy's book, there, there is an alternative which is used per and person, which it's, it's an interesting experiment. The, a study of the uterus and rats and men, yeah. Um, okay, we, um, we'll continue the discussion after we've all had a break. Uh, over in the music room, do, does anybody else on the panel have anything to say? Huh? Quick. Quick? Okay, thank you very much. Kate Wilhelm. Susie Sharnas, Amanda Banker, and Marty Randall.